This component that I'm going to be showing you is called uh, Basic Shift Assessment, uh, which is the foundation for your physical assessment that you'll be doing. We're going to be doing um, general survey, a little bit on mental status. We're also going to be doing a abdominal assessment, respiratory assessment, a little bit of cardiac assessment and a peripheral vascular assessment. You have a guideline <clears throat> that's been printed for you with the priorities that you need to assess as an NUR 118 foundational student. And in here has all the things that will cue you and remind you when you're practicing this on each other in the nursing laboratory, or I encourage you to practice it on your family members at home. So I first want to talk a little bit about assessment techniques. The first thing that we should do as a nurse is inspect our patient, look at them. And you're looking at them, what we call a general survey. You're looking at their demeanor a bit, their posture, their general skin color, their speech. Is it clear? Is it concise? And if a patient is in acute care, you're also going to be looking at line reconciliation. What are they attached to? Do they have a catheter? Do they have an intravenous line? Do they have oxygen? So that you can um, make a great assessment about lines because remember that's part of your general survey. The other thing you want to look at is their body type and if they were sitting up or walking around you could look at their gait and their balance and if their extremities were well aligned, etc. So the first thing we're always going to do is inspect and observe for any system that we do in regards to physical assessment. The next thing we're going to do is palpate the patient. When we palpate a patient, we use our fingertips to denote a sense of whether we're checking at edema, whether we're checking pulse points for palpation. Remember the rule of thumb is when you're checking somebody's temperature, which I will be on Monique in a moment, you want to use the back of your hands because the inner aspect of your hands are typically pretty warm and it could alter that temperature kind of mechanism. You're checking the temp throughout the body. The last piece, um, or not last piece, before last piece, is auscultation. Listening to sounds that the body emits with a stethoscope. Remember, the stethoscope will amplify the sound, um, and the bell is used for more finite sounds. To be perfectly honest, I'm a person that uses the diaphragm for most anything, but again, um, Remember that the ear pieces go in a certain way. If you get it in the wrong way, then you won't hear the sound adequately. So we can listen to breath sounds, bowel sounds, heart sounds uh, with the stethoscope. The last piece is called percussion and it's an old science. Um, when you percuss, you're actually taking one object and percussing over a body part you can use your finger. Uh, some people use finger over finger, but for me now, I don't have the strength to do that adequately to emit a sound. What I'm looking for when I'm percussing is timpani, dullness, resonance, sounds that are created when an organ or when there's a solid area versus a air-filled area. And I will be demonstrating this as well. So those are the assessment techniques. We're going to be doing breath sounds. We're going to be doing also um, apical pulse. We're going to be listening over the valves. We're going to be doing an abdominal uh, inspection and then a peripheral vascular. So before I start all of this, what I'm going to be doing again is washing my hands when I enter the room. I'm going to swipe. Hi, my name is Evie. How are you today? I'm well. Thank You're well. Hi. So, um, I'm going to be doing a bit of a physical exam today. I'm going to start with um, just doing a little bit on uh, your cognition and your, your pupils. I'm going to just check and make sure everything's working okay there. Um, 
and then I'm going to go with your heart, lungs, abdomen, and your periphery. But first thing before I get started, for safety purposes, could you give me your name and date of birth? Sure, Monique Weil, October 21st, 1990. Awesome, well, thank you. And you're feeling okay and comfortable at this moment before we start? I am comfortable. Okay. I'm going to put the rail down so I can get closer to you. Okay. So if I was doing a general survey on Monique, here I could see that she's a bit pale in color. Her lips are symmetrical. She um, seems to, she has a journey on so she seems to be well attired. Her speech was clear and concise and appropriate to the conversation. So Monique, can you tell me um, what date it is today? May 27th. Okay, it's actually the 28th, but it's easy mm -hmm. to lose a little bit of time, that's okay. And can you tell me, um, I introduced myself earlier when I was doing vital signs. Can you remember what my name is? Evie. Very, very good. When did you graduate from high school? In 2002. 2002, okay. So you're, you're doing remote, recent, and current memory, okay? And the other thing you could do for current, even more recent memory would be if you were in the room and she had had breakfast, you could ask her what she had for breakfast to see if she could remember that a short time ago. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna check Monique's pupils to see if they're equal, reactive, round, to light, and accommodation. Okay, Monique, just look forward. Okay. Her pupils are reactive, round, to light, um, and then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do accommodation. Okay, and her eyes are accommodating to the object. Okay, so the next thing I would do is I would make sure that Monique, I would look to see what kind of line she was attached to. She had a urinary catheter, an, an IV, a dressing. Those are things that you want to check first thing in the morning to make sure <clears throat> that the lines are draining appropriately and that everything is patent, etc. Also we'll look to see if she had a cast or a splint or any devices that were attached to her are considered your general survey. So the next piece that I'm going to do with Monique is I'm going to do her breath sounds. Breath sounds, normally as air passes, it goes down into, remember air goes into your lungs, oxygen. Your lungs are just a conduit to get the oxygen into the bloodstream. Oxygen fuels metabolism. That's why we breathe. So we listen to a patient's breath sounds to see if there's anything impeding that. Is there congestion? Are there wheezes? Are there crackles? Uh, the other thing is that normally as air passes through the respiratory cycle, when it goes through the trachea, there's a definite inspiratory to expiratory cycle or inspiration to expiration cycle. As the air, as we start to breathe and it goes down into the trachea, the inspiration is short and the expiration is long. As it goes into the mid lungs, as the air gets carried through there, the inspiration expiration cycle is equal. And as it gets into the vesic into the posterior or the lower lobes, the vesicular areas, what we call vesicular, it is equal. So bronchial sounds, short inspiration, long expiration, bronchovesicular, equal inspiration to expiration. And vesicular in the periphery is a long and short. And it's as the air flows through, that's the normal. So when you're listening to normal breath sounds on an individual, you're going to listen over the trachea, over the bronchovesicular and vesicular area. You're always going to compare side to side and you're going to go from top to bottom. Um, 
There are other, also other breath sounds that are called adventitious breath sounds. And your adventitious breath sounds are categorized three ways. Crackles, coarse wheezing, and wheezing. Crackles almost sound like cellophane. And crackles are typically heard on the end of inspiration. And crackles indicate that there's some sort of fluid or a fluid status in particular. When people have heart failure, we hear crackles. But you can also hear crackles with a really what we call moist pneumonia. Crackles do not clear with a cough. They will not change. You cannot cough them out. Next are your coarse wheezes. They used to be called ronchi. We're not supposed to use that term, but you will hear it. And ronchi indicates air going through congestion, mucus. Usually it's in the larger airways, your pneumonias, your bronchitis. Um, and it's very sonorous, it's very loud, and it can change with coughing. And you can clear this with coughing. Your last uh, breath sound category is called wheezing. Wheezing is caused by constricted airways. When the airways are constricted and the air tries to go through, it will cause a very musical, loud, squeaking sound that can be heard on inspiration and expiration. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, the best thing to do is to make sure that your patient can sit up and you always have your instruct your patient to breathe in through their nose and out through their mouth. So you should never listen over a gown. I'm gonna to try to just, I'm gonna do this so that we maintain modesty. And I'm gonna first start over the tracheal area. Go ahead and breathe in and out. So she's got a very short inspiration, long expiration. Now I'm going to move to the bronchovesicular area. Breathe in and out. Okay. And again, bronchovesicular. It's very equal in sound, equal inspiration to expiration. It's also clear. I don't hear so far any adventitious breath sounds. Now, women have breast. We don't listen over breast. So we listen underneath. And then a really critical area to listen to, and this is the vesicular area, is your laterals. And you'll often see a lot of patients who have heart failure, their cardiologists come in and they listen laterally. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just put your arm this way, go ahead and rest it. And I'm going to listen to Monique's lateral, lateral areas. Monique, take a nice breath in. Definitely long and short. I'm going to listen over here on the other side. The inflow of air is very much long and short and clear bilaterally. Now I'm going to listen to her back, okay? And remember not to listen over bones. You have scapula back here. And you're always gonna compare from side to side, side to side, top to bottom. let you rest. Now I know in the book it shows about 18 points to have a person breathe, but you can't do that. They get dizzy, especially if they're clear. There's no need to do that. Um, you have to let them rest in between because if they're blowing off too much CO2, they'll get dizzy. Okay. So her breath sounds were clear bilaterally, anteriorly, 
posteriorly and laterally. That is a comprehensive respiratory assessment. Okay, the other thing with the respiratory assessment you'll, you will do later on is you will be looking at chest size, you'll be looking at capillary refill, general color, clubbing, and all those pieces. All right. Now the next thing I'm going to be doing is an, what we call point of maximal intensity for the apical pulse. An apical pulse is is what we listen to and you should listen to on all your patients so that you can get accustomed to from day one listening to adventitious heart sounds or what a normal heart sound sounds like and as a <clears throat> young coronary care nurse years ago um, I was taught to always listen to myself which was normal at that time and um, then listen to my patient if I had a question about whether the heart sound was normal or not. Now, we teach you in the first semester to do a point of maximal intensity. In order to get the point of maximal intensity, you need to go mid-clavicular line, fourth or, fourth or fifth interspace, and that's where the point of maximal intensity, where you'll hear it, the loudest, your apical pulse. Now, if you have breasts, that's not gonna work. You kinda have to go under the breast in the best way that you can, okay? If you're having, some patients you won't hear apical pulses. They have thick chest walls, you will not hear that. Sometimes to get an apical pulse, I'd have to turn the patient on their left side, and then that would bring the heart closer to the surface so I could hear an apical pulse. Now, apical pulses should be regular, and you're gonna hear two sounds, lub-dub, 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 lub-dub. The lub is closure of the tricuspid and the, <clears throat> excuse me, mitral valve, and the dub is closure of the aortic and pulmonic valve, S1, S2. Tricuspid mitral, closure of those valves as blood goes through, and then S2, is your aortic and pulmonic closure of the valve. So, um, we're going to teach you not only to check apical pulse, but to listen over what we call the four valves. A point to make. Aortic valve is second intercostal on the right. That's where the heart is ejecting the blood out. You're gonna listen over there to hear any abnormal blood flow, which would be called a murmur. A murmur, instead of having just a clean lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-sh-dub, lub dub boom, you're gonna hear these adventitious sounds, which means that the valve isn't opening or closing appropriately. So we're gonna teach you to listen over the aortic, second intercostal on the right, pulmonic, second intercostal on the left, tricuspid, fourth or fifth interspace, and mitral, more medial. We're gonna teach you to listen over these areas so that if you hear an abnormal sound over those areas, it'll indicate which valve is abnormal. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do her apical pulse. I'm gonna count for a full minute. And any time the radial pulse is irregular, you should do an apical pulse. So here is her clavicle. I'm going to go two, three. Okay, I'm going to listen to her apical pulse. I'm gonna have you place that a little bit, a couple of inches over from my finger. This is what I do with patients in cardiac rehab that are clothed. Lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub one, lub-dub two, lub-dub three, lub-dub four, lub-dub five, lub-dub six, lub-dub seven. I'm not gonna listen for a full minute, but if I did, I'd say her pulse was 70, regular, with no extra heart beats noted. Also, um, no murmurs, swishing, swirring, abnormal sounds. 
Now I'm going to listen to her aortic pulsation right over the aortic valve. So I'm going to go down two interspaces. You're going to hear the S2 louder here because you're listening over the aortic area, which creates the S2 sound, right? Your aortic pulmonic, the closure of those valves. S2 is much louder than S1. I hear no murmurs, it's regular, and I hear no extra heart sound. Now I found here, I found her second interspace. All I've got to do to get the pulmonic is slide over here. So I slid over to the pulmonic area to listen if there's any valvular disturbances going through the pulmonic valve. S2 is clearly louder. S1, S2 are regular, no murmurs, no extra heart sounds. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go four interspaces down and I'm going to listen to the tricuspid area, four to five. Oh my, S1, you're a good candidate. S1 is much louder because remember your tricuspid and mitral valve create S1. The closure of the tricuspid valve and the mitral. Okay, now I'm gonna have you put it in the mitral area immediately under your breast. Lub is much louder than dub. Tricuspid mitral, that's what creates the S1. And both the heart sounds are regular, no murmurs and no uh, extra heart sounds. You'll talk about extra heart sounds in the fourth semester, which are created by fluid volume overload in the heart. Okay, <clears throat> the next thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing an abdominal assessment. So I'm going to put her down if she can tolerate it. Now remember, patients that have abdominal surgery, you want to be very careful. Sometimes you have to put a pillow under their knee to take the pressure off the abdomen. Okay, so remember the first thing that you do with an abdominal assessment is you inspect. Now. In this system, there's a little change in order because with this particular system, you're not going to, you're, you're going to first of all look and then you're gonna listen. You're not gonna palpate or percuss because you can alter the bowel tones. Next, you're going to look, listen with your stethoscope to bowel sounds and then you're going to palpate, percuss and palpate. Okay, so when I'm looking at this, her um, abdomen uh, certainly uh, is not distended at all. Her umbilicus is midline and centered. She has a few little moles here. She also has very little striae. Um, she has no hernias, no pulsations. She, uh, every, Everything looks pretty uh, within what we would consider the normal abdominal assessment parameters. Now the next thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be listening to bowel sounds. Peristalsis. Peristalsis by definition is an involuntary movement, right, caused by the central nervous system that moves things down through the bowel. We teach students to learn and listen in the way that the normal colon anatomy is. So this is ascending colon, transverse, and descending. You're going to listen, there's four quadrants here. You're gonna start in this quadrant, ascending area, gonna move up, go over here and down to here, because that's the way peristalsis flows. Normal peristaltic movement or bowel sounds, which means things are, your bowel's alive, things are moving through 
uh, and very important for post-operative patients um, to assess these. Um, you're going to listen to all the four quadrants and make sure that uh, it falls within normal. So you should hear bowel, tone, bowel tones in all quadrants five to, between five to 15 seconds. If it is greater than that, we call it hypoactive bowel tones or bowel sounds. And if it is below the five seconds, it's almost going all the time, it's hyperactive. Now in patients who have had surgery for the first few days, especially bowel surgery, you may not hear bowel tones. It takes a while for the peristalsis to uh, re in, re kind of reinitiate itself. If you don't hear bowel tones, you need to listen at least three minutes to conclude that there are none because they can be intermittent sounds. So I'm gonna start down here, Monique. You need to have your watch handy so you can time them. Hers are going constantly, so they'd be hyperactive in the right lower quadrant. I'm going to move here. Same thing, under, okay, it is under five seconds. I'm going to move over here. This was about six seconds, so it falls within normal, five to 15. Same here. So, she falls in, in, in the right lower, <clears throat> in the right upper. She's got hyperactive bowel sounds because they are almost constant. Over here, in the, in the left upper and left lower, she falls between the five and 15 seconds, which is the normal occurrence of bowel tones. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to percuss her abdomen. And you should hear uh, tympany over air-filled areas and dullness over a full bladder or a liver. So I'm going to take this instrument against my finger Sounds pretty empty. Not quite as much, a little duller here. Over here is the gastric air bubble. So more tympany here. The next piece is that I want students to learn how to palpate the abdomen and when you pal I'm putting gloves on because I may get down close to her pubis and her bladder so when you palpate you're getting a sense of any tenderness or any masses um, so what I'm going to do is I'm always going to look at my patient's face is this tender and you're not gonna do the deep palpation that they'll teach you when you go on to school. Monique is in school getting another degree. Uh, we're just doing a light one to two inch palpation. Any tenderness? No. I don't feel any masses. I don't feel any cysts that move around. And as a nurse, I want you to be able to palpate the bladder, especially uh, for a patient that's indicating that they can't urinate. And it's right over the symphysis pubis bone right here. Can you feel me on your bladder? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not too full. Okay, great. All right. Okay, the last part of this assessment is going to be the peripheral vascular assessment. Okay, so we, when we're assessing the peripheral vascular system, we're assessing circulation that's running through the body, all right? All of that perfusion going through the vasculature. So when you're doing your peripheral vascular assessment, you're going to be checking pulse points throughout the body. Not counting them, 
just assessing them for amplitude. How well you feel that pulsation with your fingers. So we've already done the apical pulse, but when you're doing the peripheral vascular system, there's other components besides pulse points. You're going to be looking at general skin color. You're going to also be looking to see if uh, the presence of hair, if especially in a male, if they don't have hair on their legs, they have peripheral vascular insufficiency because you don't have enough blood circulating to your lower extremities. So men that have hairless legs, if they don't shave it, uh, is usually due to a peripheral vascular problem. And our patients who have peripheral artery disease don't have hair on the lower legs, definitely. Okay, so you're gonna be looking for hair. You're going to also be checking the temperature of the extremities with the back of your hands, temperature. Temperature of the extremities, texture. Right, skin is soft, okay. Um, you're also going to uh, be looking at capillary refill. Remember, if you depress your nail bed, it should fill with blood within three seconds. If it doesn't, you have diminished circulation. The other thing you're going to be looking at is nail angle. Patients with hypoxia have clubbing of fingers, and what happens is their nail angle exceeds the 160 degrees. You don't even need to measure it. You'll see the clubbing of an extremity. It's very, very obvious. So we're checking capillary refill, temperature, texture, turgor, general skin color is, her extremities are a little pinker. Her face is a little pink right now. Maybe I got her going, I don't know. Okay. So initially you inspect, okay, and you look. And then what we're going to be doing, the parameters with this, we're also going to be doing circulation checks, pulse points, sensory checks, because again, in order to have good sensation, you have to have good vasculature. That's why patients with diabetes who don't have good vasculature flow or flow throughout their extremities get neuropathy as well. And motion. Do they have good motor movement? People with peripheral artery disease do not. They have a lot of pain called claudica claudication. I'm sorry. Okay, so we're also going to be checking edema, fluid buildup in the tissue, second spacing of fluid. When we have too much fluid, it's going to leak out the vasculature and go into the tissue. So we're also going to be looking at that as well. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check her sensation. There's a number of things that you can do. You can take a vibratory fork, close your eyes, Minnie, and tell me, whoops, when you feel the vibration. Now, 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 now. And again, you do the same thing here. Now, 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 now. Good. All right. The other thing that you can do if you don't have a vibratory fork, because they're, they're not that common on the floors, <laughs> you can also take a cotton and have her close her eyes and tell me when I'm touching you. Just say touch. Touch, touch. Again, extremities. The other thing that you can do is a sharp and dull. Okay? So when you're doing sharp and dull, <clears throat> okay, the patient needs to denote whether it's dull or sharp. This is more definitive for sensory. Alright? So Monique, keep your eyes closed. This is sharp and this is dull. Okay? So you just tell me what you what you feel. Sharp, dull, sharp, dull, sharp, 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 okay? 
so sharpened out so her sensory input responds to sharpened out touch and the vibratory four all right um the next thing i'm going to do is get a general um sense of her muscle function so to get a general session as uh, excuse me assessment what i'm going to do is i'm going to have her squeeze my hands okay push against me right. now i want to have you try to adduct your arm towards your body pull it in okay push it out pull it in push it out Especially important with patients with epidural drips. <laughs> okay. I want you to bend your okay. I want you to push against my hand. Okay. Again. Alright. I want you to try to pull out. Pull it pull in. Pull in. Okay, good. Sorry. Push out. Rip. In. Okay. Great. So you get a general sense she's got good good resistance against opposition good motor activity okay so that's the c the c i'm going to be doing in a moment more circulation pulse points the s sensory and motor so now i'm going to be uh doing the pulse points yeah <clears throat> i did her radial earlier and you're going to rate them on a scale of one plus two plus three plus and four plus it's all in your handout one plus zero means I can't feel a pulse. One plus, I'm not sure I feel a pulse. It may be a little thready, a little weak, I'm not really sure. And the point is, if you get a one plus or zero, you need to get a Doppler, which I'll show you how to use in a moment, which amplifies arterial sounds. It's very, very important after people have vascular surgery that you make sure they have pulse points in the operative extremity. So, zero means you can't feel one. One plus is diminished, two is normal, three you can feel very easily, very easily palpable, and four, it's bounding. You can almost see it pulsating, all right? Three plus. That's the brachial. Radial, I'm sorry. That's the radial, excuse me. This is the brachial. This one's about two plus, and that's not uncommon for that one, okay? I've already done her apical pulse, and now I'm going to move to the femoral area. When you're doing the femoral, femoral pulse especially, you better get accustomed to where that is because when you have a code situation, uh, that's where you're going to try to find it. It's a pretty big artery, that or, okay. Okay, so it's in the panty line, so you have to, it's deep. So you have to put your hands down in the panty line feel yours you feel me on it mm -hmm. she's pretty thin so she's easy to find it's a good two to three plus it's pretty good all right I'm gonna take this off panty line for males and females now the popliteal you won't find in a lot of the population especially if you have a thick leg the popliteal pulse is right under the knee, and I use four fingers in hopes that I can find it. Oh, I found, I found yours. Perfect specimen. Okay, two plus. Now, this is where students, when we know students don't know what they're doing, <laughs> there's a pulse point underneath the malleolus right here, okay? Inner malleolus, okay, not outer, inner, okay? This is called the posterior tibial pulse, and this is a two plus, okay? You also have a pedal, dorsal pedis pulse. 
that runs on, and when people have surgery, typically on their legs, vascular surgery, you need to make sure that these are present, the pedal and the posterior tib. So the posterior tibialis, what you're going to do is run it through the first and second, here's the road to it, so to speak, in between the first and second toe, and then it's usually down here a bit. Got a good pulse, two plus, okay? All right. Now I'd also check capillary refill, but I cannot on Monique, she has some pretty blue polish on. Okay, so now let's say her pulse was one plus. Let's say I wasn't sure I felt it. On all of the acute care units, okay, we have Dopplers that amplify sound. It's kind of the same Doppler that you use for babies to see if their pulse is in there going on, right, when they're in utero. You need to put um, an ultrasonic gel, okay, on the end of the probe, and you need to put a lot, like you put for your toothpaste, <laughs> okay? Now, because these pulse points are small, you need to swim around to find them. Just relax your foot. Try the posterior tip. See if I get some better sounds. I can hear it so low. It's really important when you use equipment on multiple patients because Dopplers are very expensive. Okay, um, that you clean the equipment. Okay, in between use with your cavity wipes. Okay. The next thing that I'm going to be checking is I'm going to be checking for some edema. Now typically edema, fluid, swelling, second spacing, fluid escaping the vascular space into the tissue. Gravity will float it down first, so you get in your feet, in your legs. But sometimes people have edema, severe edema, um, all the way up, even in the sacral area, and it's called anasarca. But typically what we do, right, especially for people with heart failures or venous insufficiency, is we um, check for edema, typically around the ankle area, around the tibia. This is where it'll sneak. And you really have to, when you're measuring edema, you go with a scale of one to four plus. And um, 
One plus is when you depress into the tissue, it'll depress two millimeters. So one plus is two millimeters depth, two plus is four millimeters depth, three plus is six millimeters depth, and eight plus is um, four plus. Eight millimeters is four plus, so sorry. Okay, so I'm looking for edema here and I don't see any depressions. She has no edema at all. She has no swelling. And sometimes with people who have a lot of swelling, you're gonna go and you're gonna notice it all the way up the legs and into the abdomen, okay? If they have significant fluid overload, heart failure, venous insufficiency, whatever the issue may be. So edema check is the last piece that we do. Did I forget anything with the peripheral vascular that you can think of? Nope. You sure? Ruber. Ruber, okay, yeah. So we did talk a little bit about where we checked about general color. Remember, people with peripheral artery disease, no hair, and they have a ruber especially dependent ruber. They're gonna put their legs down and they get bright red. Uh, and um, people with venous insufficiency have this brown deposition of material, brown hemosiderin, and um, it's caused by lack of adequate blood flow to the surface of the legs. Um, those are kind of classic things. You're gonna learn the difference between venous insufficiency uh, peripheral artery disease this semester. So this pretty much concludes our uh, basic shift assessments that you're going to learn this semester and you should practice universally throughout the clinical setting. Thank you.